And we're uh, finishing up Numbers 18. Last night we uh, introduced you to this week's Torah portion, which happens to be coincidental to the fact that Numbers 19 is this week's Torah reading. So if you are keeping up with your weekly Torah readings, then the annual reading cycle, then you know exactly where we are in the scriptures and in the story that's going on. We know that in uh, Numbers 18, we, we see the, the uh, charge that God is giving to the Levitical line, to the priesthood, and how they are to be taken care of. And it's important that we understand that God's kingdom work is to be supported by the kingdom. Uh, Yeshua said that a, wake, a, a worker is worth his wages, and therefore if your work is the gospel, then the gospel should support you. If your work is of the Lord, then the Lord should support you through the tithes and offerings of the congregation. And so it's interesting to know that, that, uh, that uh, tithing is not a legalistic matter. We know it's not a legalistic matter because Abraham tithed before there was a law. And so we know it's a matter of heart. Now the requirements of tithing, oddly enough, is the Jews were required to tithe three times a year. There's three different commanded tithes. There's, there's not three times a year, but there's three different tithes. A tithe to the Levites, a tithe eaten before the Lord, and a tithe every three years that was given to the poor. So there's lots more tithing. I always like to tell the story about a pastor friend of mine called me from the Midwest and said that, uh, you know, we have the uh, Powerball here. And I said, yeah, I'm familiar with it. And he goes, and I had a congregant come to me, and I'm kind of in a dilemma. They won $10 million, and they want to tithe on it, and, and they brought me a check for a million dollars, and I'm conflicted as to whether or not I should accept it. And I said, well, I would be conflicted too. He goes, then you agree with me. I said, absolutely. The check should be for four million. <laughs> I said, if you take old covenant tithing and new covenant tithing, it should be 40%, not 10%. So you need to go back to him. And he goes, you know, I'm starting to like this way of thinking. <laughs> so I want to encourage you. I don't encourage you to go play the lottery, but if you play the lottery on your own, Okay, you're going to have a conversation with me about tithing on the winnings, and uh, I'll encourage you to fully embrace all the blessings of a full-bodied 40% tithe. But the tithe was to be 10%, and so the 10% of the crops were brought in, and then the Levites tithed on that, just as my wife and I tithe on what we receive. So we tithe back to the congregation what the congregation provides for us. And so that's biblical, and it was the system that God implemented. So pastors, rabbis aren't exempt from tithing. Uh, we tithe on our package that we receive here. That's biblical. And so the congregation itself tithes. You know, 10% of whatever comes into the congregation goes back out in missions to Israel and to uh, Jewish work throughout the United States as well as to benevolence. So when you see or you hear that a family is being supported in some way, shape, or form, then you take comfort to the fact that the widows and the orphans and those who are in need are being supported by the congregation. And so it's important that that be available. Does that mean that we have ongoing support? No, but people hit bumps in the road. They need a little boost. They need a little help. They need a little encouragement to get past an uh, electric bill, a gas bill, uh, some groceries. We have a Joseph storehouse where we provide food to those who are in need that cannot afford. They've hit a rough spot in the road. It happens. Yes, even to your rabbi, I was homeless in 1980. I know all about what it's like to need food, to need shelter, to need clothing. And so I understand all that. And so we have a provision in God's economy to provide for that, and we do so. So tithing is an important, there's nobody really exempt from tithing. And so, you know, God's very clear. He says, why do you rob me? How do you, why do we rob you in tithes and offerings? Is we don't put our shoulder to the, to the, to the work. We, we, but I tithe because I serve. Yes, that's one-third of your responsibility in a congregation. Okay? Tithing, money, time, giving of your time. Okay? Being here at services okay, is important. Why? It builds up the body. Okay? I've shared this before many times, and I'll share it again. Our full parking lot is a witness to this community. The lights blazing in here and people driving by and slowing down at the stop sign. And looking in the window and seeing people dancing, and there's life here at Bethel El on Shabbat, and the parking lot is full, is a witness and a light that draws people. Why do we have the blinds up? When we bought this place, the blinds were down. So why are the blinds down? Oh, we want to create an environment. Yeah, don't create an environment here. The environment's here. Share the environment out there. It's not there. Okay, the light needs to go out from this place. Don't keep the light from coming into this place. 
So we open the windows here. If these were real windows, they would be open, but they're not. They're a brick wall. They're just a, made to look like they're real windows. So there was this system that God said, and he, he said it, uh, what, what belonged to him and how he shared it back. And so all the sacred gifts in verse 19 and verse, in chapter 18, all the sacred gifts that the Israelites set aside for the Lord, I give to you, to your sons and your daughters that are with you. As a due for all time, it shall be an everlasting covenant of salt before the Lord for you and for your offspring as well. And the Lord said to Aaron, you shall, however, have no territorial share among them or own any portion in their midst. I am your portion and your share among the Israelites. And so they had no territory that was their own. It was a portion to them that they were given a part and they were given the ability to work the land. You know, even in Israel today, you do not own the land. Are you aware of that? The state of Israel owns the land. You can go get a 99-year lease on the land, and you can own the home on the land, but you cannot own the land. That's how it works in Israel, because who does it belong to? Well, the land is apportioned. It belongs to God, and he apportioned it and gave the apportionment to who? Each one of the tribes were given a certain allotment. Well, you can't sell something that doesn't belong to you. You can't buy something that doesn't. If I'm not dealing with the owner, okay, so if I go to Bob and say, Bob, I want to buy your house in Israel and, and I want a deed for the land, he says, well, I don't have the deed for the land. Why don't you have the deed for the land? Because it wasn't mine. Okay? It belongs to Naphtali. It belongs to Zebulon. It belongs to Gad. So the state of Israel has taken the land holdings, and now you can use the land, but you cannot buy the land. And so you have rights to the land. You have rights to the crops on the land. Right? And to the priests and to the Levites, they have an apportionment. They're, so when you see at the yeshiva people who are doing the work of God, who live at the yeshiva, they make their living at the yeshiva, that is all a part of that. If they work in the synagogues, not the temple, the temple doesn't stand anymore, but the hope is the temple will be rebuilt. But if they work in the synagogues, and then like myself, I receive my income from the congregation. Now for the first two years of the congregation, I was a uh, tent maker, and I received my income elsewhere uh, while I worked outside the congregation. I worked in the congregation full time, and I worked outside full time. I had two full time jobs, but I was only paid, paid for one. And so that income was used to build up the treasury of Bethlehem so that we could buy a place. And that was our vision here. That happened to be the same pattern of the vision of Rabbi Solomon in Atlanta for the first two years of his ministry. He took no salary. And it wound up being the exact same amount that they used for the down payment of Bethlehem happened to be equal to what his salary would have been. It was very similar to our situation here. And so we feel very much a part and committed. Our shoulders are in the work. Our sweat is in the work. Our tears are in the work. It is a part of us. And that's how we serve. And that's how we chose to serve. And we're not asking for something for that. What I'm pointing out to you is that the labor and the work of the ministry is important that people have a share in that. This is, this is the con- who owns this place? The congregation owns the place. The corporation of Bethel Incorporated owns this place. It's made up of all of you who are members. If you get a share in it, we're a 501c3. It cannot be given away. It cannot be sold to an individual. It, it can only go to another 501c3. It's not owned by a person. It is owned by the corporation, Bethel And so as an entity, somebody can't, I can't sell the place and put the money in my pocket. I couldn't have bought this place and then sold it to Bethlehem for an increase. Certainly had the opportunity. I was the only one that knew it was aware, was aware that it was for sale. Okay, there wasn't even a sign in the, in the yard. I was approached about it. So, but we have rules and regulations and systems in place so that no individual can benefit from the purchase or the sale of anything here. Nobody. There's no inside tra- insider trading within this corporation and with this congregation, and people are, are prohibited from participating in anything. So my salary is not set by me. I have absolutely no say whatsoever in what I get paid. Right? I have excused myself from all those discussions. And, and on, on our board, all the non-related members of the board vote on those matters. And so there can't be any, any nepotism. There can't be any uh, family influences made in that regard. And so it is in God's economy. God is the ultimate decision maker. And what he apportions, what he sets, shall be his standard. And so it was in the tabernacle and the taking care of the tabernacle and the labor. Uh, when you think about the labor that goes into the tabernacle, I want you to think about the slaughtering of animals. 
there's blood in parts, and the same person that slaughters the animal doesn't take it outside the town to burn it up, does he? No, it's a dead body now. It's unclean. So there's a whole process for all that. And as we get into the book of Numbers, we begin to understand the process for things and the separation of that which is clean and that which is unclean, the profane and the holy. Eight times in this book, God says, be holy, for I am holy. So it's very important that we understand the holiness aspect of, of the Torah and so uh, God's instructions to us. So unto the Levites I hereby give all the tithes in Israel as their share in return for the services they perform, the services of the tent of meeting. Henceforth, Israelites shall not trespass on the tent of meeting and thus incur guilt and die. Only Levites shall perform the services of the tent of meeting. Others would incur guilt. It is a law for all time throughout the ages, but they shall have no territorial share amongst the Israelites, for it is the tithes set aside by the Israelites of the gift to the Lord that I give to the Israelite, to the Levites as their share. Therefore I have said concerning them, they shall have no territorial share among the Israelites. So the part and portion of the land of Israel which was divided, the biblically mandated turf of Israel. That means that there's people who are not Israel who are on the land. Yes, parts of Jordan, parts of Iraq, all the area down to the, to the biblically mandated borders of Israel are occupied by people who don't have a right to be there. And east of the Jordan, where the two tribes settled is also land that was apportioned and given as an inheritance to them by God. And even though it's not Jewish people or it's not the tribes living on it now, it's Jordanians living on it now, then when the God restores the boundaries of Israel and the 12 tribes are restored to the land and this is the apportion given to them, the Levites still will not have a share in the territorial land assigned as an inheritance. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the Levites and say to them, When you receive from the Israelites their tithes, which I have assigned to you as your share, you shall set aside from them one-tenth of the tithe as a gift to the Lord. This is an instruction for all who are in ministry okay, that 10% goes back. So I don't have the option of not tithing on what I receive from a tithe of the congregation. It's not optional. Okay, this is an instruction. If you're required to tithe, I'm required to tithe. There's no exemption there. There's no uh, dispensation of the, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the... There you go. Right? You know this stuff. This shall be accounted to you as your gift. Isn't it interesting that God puts it in the Hebrew in terms of a gift? Many people talk in terms of an obligation. It's a requirement. It's a legal ruling. It's a burden. It's not a burden, it's a gift. Let me tell you about the other part of the equation. If you give 10%, what do you get to keep? 90%. Oh, we love to claim that, you know, oh, my God owns a cattle on a thousand hills, and oh, this is all this, all this great stuff, okay, but what's mine is mine, and what's his is mine. Well, wait a minute, it doesn't work that way. Everything you have is his. Everything you have came from him. Well, what about uh, my hard work? Yeah, who gave you the ability? Who gave you the opportunity? Who gave you favor in that workplace to get the job in the first place? Who gave you that skill? Who opened that door for you? Who equipped you? Who breathed life into you? Who chose your mother and father? Who chose the house you would live in? Well, I guess he did. Well, then it all belongs to him, and he's letting you keep 90% of it, and you don't think that's a good deal. I think that's a great deal. When I worked in the corporate world, that was actually my deal with my employer. They had uh, commission plans, all kinds of commission plans. They had, you know, if you sold this much, you got this much, and you got this percentage, you got that. But, and I was very, very confused, so I was just simple, and I said, okay, I'll tell you what. You know how much you make on every deal I make? He goes, yes. I said, okay. And it's all profit-driven. He goes, yes. I said, okay, I'll just take 10% of the profits. If it's good enough for God, it should be good enough for you. He said, okay. So I went out, and the only deals I ever did were the highest possible profit deals. And he came to me, and he said, you only, you're, you cherry pick. You just take the best deals out there. And I said, yeah, and your problem with that would be what? Well, look at how much you're making. I said, look at how much I'm making. You get to keep 90%. And you're going to begrudge me the 10%. He said, yeah, but you just take the big profit deals. I said, the more I make, the more you make. 
but he didn't like that deal, so he cut my, my uh, plan in half. And he said, I want you to work just as hard. And then I heard less straw. That's what I heard. More bricks, less straw. I said, okay. So I said, Lord, if this is what you want me to do, I'm not going to go and complain. I'm going to go out and do it. And so then the next six months, I did three times as much business, and my 50% cut wound up being a 75% increase. So he came to me and he said to me, he goes, you know, you're still doing that same thing that I told you I didn't want you to do. You're still cherry picking the best deals and you're still making all this. And so I'm going to cut you another 50%. All right, Miss Laura, look at Miss Laura. Look at her with a big grin on her face because she's shaking her head because this is exactly what happened. And so I said, okay. I was seeing what God was doing. I said, okay, hurt me some more. You sure you don't want to cut me 90%? No, 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 I'm just going to cut you 50%. So then the next six months, I did six times as much. <laughs> now I was making three times as much as I started out making. So he said to me he wanted to have a meeting, and I said, no need. You want to cut me another 50%. Come on. I'm having a great time. We moved into a new house. We bought new cars. We were having the time of our life. And he said, well, this, I don't understand this. This is ridiculous. I said, well, I do. Bring it. So he said, okay, well, you know, I, I need to cut your pay another 50%. I said, okay, that's great. And everybody in the company would come to me and say, can you believe what he's doing? I said, oh, yeah, I'm loving this. This is the greatest thing ever. And they go, you, you're sick. There's something wrong with you. So in three months' time, I made a year's worth of income. Look at Miss Laurel. Okay. Three months' time, first three months of the year, I made as much as I had made the entire year before. Because on January the 1st, he cut me again. And here's what happened. On the first work day of that year, I received a phone call. And one client said, I want to give you a $14 million contract under the proviso that you and you alone are the only person in the company I deal with. I said, okay, I can do that. And I hung up the phone and I calculated and I said, honey, I, by March 31st, I'll be done. I'll have made all in the first three months of the year, everything I made last year. And she's going, do you think I'll cut you again? I said, I really hope so. <laughs> you can't outgive God. And as soon as you learn the lesson, you can't outgive God. And if you read in Matthew, he says that if to follow him, if you are willing to give up your home, your family, your property, and your possessions, not only will he restore that to you in the kingdom of heaven, but catch this, he says, I'll give it to you on earth. I'll give it to you on earth and in heaven. I'll restore it all to you on earth and in heaven. There's many rewards that you say that you only get in heaven. Oh, if you take a beating for something you didn't do, great will be your reward in the kingdom of heaven. Here's the one that says, if you leave it all behind for him, if you're willing to give it up for him, if you're not attached, if you let it go, if you just go ahead and put it into his hands, he'll restore it all to you on earth and in heaven. Read it for yourself. It's a great promise. So all of you that are holding on tight, holding on tight, building up treasures on earth, it's just wood, hay, and stubble. Earl. I have, <clears throat> I have two questions. Where is that in the Bible that, that you just... What's that? Where is that a statement that you just mentioned in the Bible? I think it's Matthew 26. Is it Matthew 26? I could be mistaken. Okay. Secondly, how does uh, verse 29 relate to today? Be sure to give to the Lord the best portions of the gifts given to you. Today, what is the best portions? What would that be? The first fruits. Right off the top. Okay. Off the top. What, what would be the best portion? Let me tell you how the natural world says it. It says, well, my paycheck says $922.77. And so you write a check for $92.77. That's not the first. That's not the best. The best was the top line, the gross. Okay? The gross. 
All right? Now, when you call me and say, hey, I just got a $3,000 tax refund, do I need to tithe on it? And I say, nope, you already did. You mean I get to keep the whole amount? Yeah, you do, because you already did your part. Okay? But if you didn't do your part, then not only do you, need, do you owe the money, but you owe 20% above that for redeeming the tithe. And God has a provision for that. Look, all of us hit, you know, it's great to sail through life with never having a problem, never having with a kid with a need, never having a car that drops a transmission, never having an unexpected expense. But the truth of the matter is we do have unexpected expenses. And so what do you do? Okay? I got $83 in the bank and I need to write out my tithe check. Okay, but I got an $83 repair on the air conditioner. I can suffer without air conditioning until my next paycheck a month from now, or I can use that money, but then I can't tithe. Let me tell you the right way to do this. The right way to do this is pick up the phone and call and say, hey, Rabbi, I got a problem. You put it out there, you take it out of this deep place, because that's where it's going to fester. That's where the enemy is going to just work on you and work on you and work on, and condemn you. You say, Rabbi, I'm in, I got a problem, man. I'm trying to be on the straight and narrow. I'm trying to do the right thing, but I'm, I'm at this crossroads. I don't know what to do. Would it shock you to hear, listen, go ahead and pay the tithe and we'll pay for that repair? What? It could be $250. Go ahead and pay your tithe and do your part and let us help you. You might be shocked. Or you might be shocked to hear, go ahead and use that money. God doesn't want you to suffer. You've been faithful in your time. You've been faithful in your service. You've made that extra trip over here. You made six extra trips over here last month because we had special events going on. I'll bet your $83 went in your gas tank to come to the house of the Lord six extra times last month. Well, yeah, now that you bring it up, it did. Well, God's going to honor that. He's not going to punish you because you used that to serve the Lord. It's not supposed to be a punishment for you. It's not supposed to be a condemnation. It's supposed to be a blessing. The Lord says in His Word, Malachi 3.10 through, through 13, He says, test me in this and see if I want to throw apart the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing. How do we ever get to be a blessing to you if you don't talk to us? How do we ever get to do our job if you don't share it with us? How do you get to ever get to take it out of the darkness and put it into the light and shed the light of love and the light of Messiah into it and allow us to do our part and counsel and guide and lead you and direct you if you don't give us the opportunity? Doesn't the Word of God say there's wisdom in a multitude of godly counsel? If anyone is in need, what are you supposed to do? Ask. You're supposed to ask. How do we know you're in need? How do we know in Acts chapter 2 when it said that they sold what they had and took care of each other and no one had a need? Because they talked to each other. Oh, this is my little problem. This is my little secret. This is my little stuff. And people counsel me. People come to me and say, I'm at this crossroads. I'm overwhelmed with debt. I made some bad decisions, and it's, it's overwhelming me, and I've committed myself to some things that I shouldn't have done. And it's, well, did you, did you tithe? Yeah, I tithe. Did you serve? Yeah, I served. Did you make some bad decisions? Yeah, I made some bad decisions. Okay. All right. Have you done everything you possibly could? I did everything I possibly could, but the company I worked for folded. I didn't expect to lose my job. I was paying that money back. I was paying it back. I paid it back, and the company folded. Now I'm unemployed, and I'm 63 years old. And the likelihood of me going out and getting another job that's going to replace that income, it could take me six months. It could take me a year. It might take me a while. And Social Security and unemployment aren't going to cover it. And if I don't do something, I'm going to lose my home. You might be surprised when you say, have you considered bankruptcy? It's a provision in the law to bankrupt, to get relieved of those obligations. Now, if you choose after bankruptcy to go back and pay those people, that's up to you if your conscience is clear. It's up to you. But it's not illegal. It's not sin. Okay, breaking the law is sin, even if it's the law of the land. It's sin. Okay, it says submit to the authority, the ruling and governing party. But, you know, there's things about money you know, talking about your salvation, you talk about it all the time. Talk about pornography. You, you don't mind talking to me about pornography. Adultery. You'll come in and confess adultery to me. You'll come in and talk to me about stealing. You'll talk to me about anger. You'll talk to me about jealousy. You'll talk to me about homosexuality. But boy, when it comes to money, <laughs> now we're getting personal. Now, Rabbi, you crossed the line. 
Okay? Talking to me about adultery, I didn't, I didn't really have a problem with that. Talking to me about this, I didn't have a problem with that. But now you're, now you're getting personal. Because why? It's because of our attachment to money. And God set up this whole provision of what we're supposed to do to release into his hand. What belongs to him? What he wants is the best part. Which best part did he withhold from us? Nothing. Think about it. What did he withhold from you? What, the oldest person who ever lived on earth was how old? 900 and, 900 and something, okay? Lately, 104 makes the newspaper, right? 100 makes the newspaper, right? We know some people in their 90s, right? So if something was only going to last for 100 years, would you consider it permanent or temporary? Temporary. temporary. So all of you are temporary. All of your problems are temporary. All of your health issues are temporary. What we invest in when we don't invest in the Lord's economy is temporary. All we're doing is feeding pleasure and current needs. What about eternity? What about for the long haul? What about for the rest of time? And so we're so distracted with holding on to what we have on earth that if we just let go of it, I'm not just talking about money, I'm talking about anger, I'm talking about unforgiveness, I'm talking about what other people do to you, what they say to you. If you let them go, if you take your hands off and release it, who gets set free? Them? No, they go on to a higher authority. You get set free. You're not in bondage anymore. What's the gospel say? What does Yeshua say? What does Isaiah say? Came to bind up the brokenhearted and what? Set the captives free. Well, none of you are in prison, but all of you are imprisoned. I have to look, I'm not wearing stripes. I had to look. I didn't remember what I wore this morning. <laughs> that happened to you more often? It happens to me more often. Doesn't happen to you? You're losing your hearing? <laughs> but this is what we do. And God made it so simple. If we just do what he says. The best we have to give is the first. What's supposed to be the sweetest? What's supposed to, it's the first fruits. It's the first harvest. Okay, everything else, when, a, when we pick something at its ripest, at its best, that's what we're supposed to give to the Lord. First fruits. He gave us his first. He gave us his best. And he calls for us to do that. So as with, this shall be accounted to you as your gift, as with the new grain from the threshing floor, the flow from the vat. So shall you on your part set aside a gift for the Lord from all the tithes that you receive from the Israelites. And from them you shall bring the gift for the Lord to Aaron the priest. You shall set aside all gifts due to the Lord from everything that is donated to you, from each thing its best portion, the part thereof, that is to be consecrated. Now we know that on the cow, what's the best portion? That which is burned that gives off the best aroma. See, if the Lord is a consuming fire, doesn't the Word of God say the Lord's a consuming fire? So what's that in reference to? That fire on the altar. He's a consuming fire. So we put the fat portion on the altar, right? We put this big, meaty, fatty portion, and what does it do? Mmm. Ah. Smells so good, doesn't it? Barbecue. Open pit barbecue, right? Doesn't that smell good? Right? Tammy, I see you, right? It smells good. Okay, Jim and Nick, smells good. Okay, full moon, smells good. Barbecue smells good. And you see that smoke coming out of the chimney, you smells good. Okay, that portion that is best for the Lord is the portion that gives off the best smoke, the best aroma, the best fragrance. Okay, that's the best portion. Now, we would say that on the cow that what? Uh, tenderloin, right? That place at filet mignon, right? Yeah, except that's the part that the Jewish people don't eat. Why? Wasn't that the part that 
got touched in that the part close to the hip that in that that part that piece that's set aside that's yeah so you'll find that people that keep kosher rabbinically kosher don't eat filet mignon don't eat tenderloin okay because that's the muscle portion that Jacob your name shall no longer be Jacob because you have striven against both God and man and prevailed your name shall be Israel that's the portion that's the part that was touched and so orthodox Jewish religious observant Jewish people don't eat that because it represents that is the muscle that is the part so we call that the best but they would tell you that it's not it's forbidden under dietary rules are you aware of that so don't, when Egal comes to your house, don't serve him. Well, yeah, that's what I was just thinking. Yeah, don't serve him that. We call it the best portion, but in this case, it's, to others, it's not. Say to them further, when you have removed the best part from it, you Levites may consider it the same as the yield of the threshing floor of that, so it's first fruits. You and your household may eat it anywhere, for it is your recompense for your services in the tent of meeting. You will incur no guilt through it once you have removed the best part from it, but you must not profane the sacred donations of the Israelites lest you die. So you can't mix clean with profane. Okay? Mixed, mingled seed. We read, uh, we haven't read yet, but in Deuteronomy it talks about mingled seed. It not only defiles the crop, but it defiles the field. Okay? Mixing things that are holy and unholy. Okay? Hot or cold, not lukewarm. You can't mix things. Okay, what's lukewarm mean? I've taken a little bit of hot water, a little bit of cold water, and I've made something lukewarm. Well, God doesn't want that. He doesn't want us to be one foot in both camps, right? You got to see the serve God or what do Yeshua say? Those who, are, who aren't for you are against you. So they didn't, it wasn't a matter of those who aren't for you are lukewarm. It was very clear that if they're not for you, they are against you. We read that the tongue has the power of what? Life and death. Not good feelings. Not, it's life or death. Blessings or curses. That's it, my friends. There's no middle ground. There's no middle ground in God's economy. So why would there be stopover places and, and uh, holding places and all these things in the kingdom of God, either you're going into heaven or you're not. Oh, but what about that waylay, or that way station where they, uh, where, you know, I don't read about that way station. I don't read about that. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, the do-overs. No, there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun, isn't there? And if something is not clean, it's unclean. It's not neutral. So if it's 99.999% effective, what does that tell me? It is ineffective. Because that level of obedience, that partial obedience, is complete disobedience. Oh, the world doesn't want to hear that stuff. Ivory soap. 99 and what? Yeah, you know, something pure. Well, that means it's contaminated, doesn't it? Isn't it? If it's only 99.9% .9 pure, then it's contaminated. It's mostly pure. Can you be mostly dead? Beth, can you be mostly dead? Well, sure, if you're Billy Crystal. And... But we have to understand this. We have to get this in order to understand, not legalism, we have to understand the power of the blood of Messiah. We have to understand that you can't meet these requirements. You can do the best you can, and it will be credited to you as righteousness, but these are things that are very, very difficult. So without the blood of Messiah, you're not getting in. It's just that simple. The sacrifice was made so that you could get in. That's not a vengeful God. That's a loving God. But he's a loving God that says, you have to do it my way, not your way. I don't need your interpretation. I don't need your commentary. I don't need your translation. I need your obedience. 
I don't need your sacrifice. I don't need your smelly offering. I need your obedience. That's what I'm calling you for, to be clean, to be set apart, to be holy. You can't mingle the holy and the unholy. You can't mingle the profane with the, with the clean. You just can't do it. We completely understand yeast, but we don't see that in any other part of our lives. A little yeast spoils the whole batch. And so God's telling us, He's giving us these particular requirements. He's saying, these are the things I want you to do. And if you're not doing them, the whole part is unclean. Well, I can't afford a tithe. I'm going to tell you, you can't afford not to tithe. You're robbing yourself. You're cheating your family. It says you bring a curse on yourself. Oh, Lord, please keep the enemy away. I tell you so clearly how to keep the enemy away. He says, if you will do this, I will rebuke the devourer on your behalf and your crops will not cast their fruit. What better evidence do you have of I want to keep the enemy away from me? He says, this is how to do it. It's no secret. I'm not the God of secrets and incantations and secret handshakes and, and, and secret greetings and secret this and secret that. I'm the God that puts it right out there. You just don't want to listen. And Ezekiel tells us about the righteous man and the unrighteous man. The unrighteous man goes through his entire life committing unrighteous acts and then turns from his unrighteousness and commits a righteous act. And God looks on the righteous act and receives him and doesn't count his unrighteousness against them. And man says that's unfair. Because God also says there's a righteous man and he continues to do righteous things all his life, but then he commits an act of unrighteousness and God doesn't count his goodness towards him. That's right. And God says, man says, I'm not fair. That's not fair. He says, your standard's not fair. Your understanding's not fair. I made it very clear to you what I expected of you, but you wanted it to be different. And now you're calling me unfair. Your standard's unfair. How do you measure goodness? Tell me how you measure good works. What's the standard for goodness? Is it uh, as long as you get a passing grade like in school, a 70 is passing and anything below 70? So what's the test? Well, I gave $1,000, but you, well, the test is, is you could, you, you, 10%, was 10%, was $1,000 10%? No, it was 1%. Oh, okay. Well, no, it was 5%. Okay. I didn't feed the orphans. I walked by that homeless person on the street and I shunned them. Thirty-one years ago, I was him. You wouldn't shun me on the street, would you? 31 years ago, I was walking hotels and eating off of room service trays. 31 years ago, I was living out of a car. The Word of God tells you, you need to feed everybody you see. You might be entertaining an angel. This is the Word of God, but we've taken this attitude. And all this is about obedience to God's Word. Which part of God's Word do we want to accept? Which part do we want to reject? Oh, but I do most of it. Partial obedience is complete disobedience. According to God's standard, not man's standard. Oh, I get an A. Well, that's good if this was school, but it's not. Chapter 19, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, This is the ritual law that the Lord has commanded. Instruct the Israelite people to bring you a red cow without blemish, in which there is no defect and on which no yoke has been laid. Anybody know about the red heifer? How many of you studied the prophecy about the red heifer? How many of you are interested in the birth of the red heifer? Raise your hands. I want to see if you're interested. All of you are interested. All right, the ashes of the red heifer are required by the Torah to cleanse the Levitical priesthood for temple work. And so the thought is, is when the next red heifer comes, the Messiah will come, right? Isn't that the thought? How many of you know about the ashes of the last red heifer? How many understand that the ashes of the next red heifer have to be mixed with the ashes of the 
last red heifer. Anybody know about that? As of May 2006, uh, there was a red heifer born three and a half years ago in Jerusalem among the cattle born, cattle born in or an imported from Mississippi. If it doesn't get disqualified like the previous red heifer candidates reported over the past years, such as Melody was the name of one of them, it could mean that one more obstacle to the construction of the Third Temple had gone. Numbers 19 is where the requirement is found in Torah. The only cure given for ritual impurity from contact with the grave was from the ashes of a red heifer. It has to be three years old, although this person said it had to be three years old. There's no such requirement found in the Bible. The tradition of it being three years old is from the oral law. Numbers 19 does not require a clean man who has never been unclean himself. To prepare for this, they've raised young people sequestered for any possible contact that would make them richly impure. This includes keeping them on rock floor dwellings to make sure that no one is buried below. The whole process is it shall be taken outside the camp, given to Eleazar, and slaughtered in his presence. If the priest shall take some of the blood with his finger and sprinkle it seven times toward the front of the tent of meeting, the cow shall be burned in his sight, its hide, flesh, and blood shall be burned, its dung included, and the priest shall take cedar wood, hyssop, and crimson stuff and throw them into the fire, consuming the cow. These were also the three elements required for the cleansing from leprosy. Earl. Yes, Rabbi, do we have the ashes of the original red heifer? Good question. That's the best question of all, Earl. Okay. And the answer is, is that the rabbis believe that they have the ashes of the red heifer, but they're not willing to disclose the whereabouts. It's also believed that the rabbis know where the Ark of the Covenant is, but they're not wanting to disclose the whereabouts. A lot of beliefs. There's a lot of taverns and tunnels and caves and, and rooms underneath the Temple Mount, underneath the, the uh, walls. And a lot of things that aren't being told. Can you imagine a Jerusalem with uh, the most sophisticated underground security systems available to man, not knowing where anything is seismically, or having images, not being able to project and read uh, through rock and underground? And, and uh, if we can see into the center of the earth, why can't we see under the rock, the dome of the rock? Okay. Well, that would lead one to believe that maybe we could. And that would lead one to believe that maybe we do know more than is being told. And so each time we go to Israel and the discussion comes about the coming Messiah and the ashes of the red heifer, it's always brought that the ashes of the first red heifer, or the last red heifer, have to be mixed with the ashes of the next red heifer in order for it to be a sign of the coming of Messiah. And so this is all based on what? Is this based on Torah? No. Okay. Now, Talmudic teachings, and it gives us a good opportunity because when we talk about Torah, we also talk about the Talmud, and the Talmud is the commentary on Torah. So when we talk about things like you can't eat a cheeseburger, and somebody says to you, well, that's in the Torah, that's not in the Torah. That's in the Talmud, about the Torah. It's like uh, expressions that we know, such as God helps those who help themselves. Haven't you heard that one that's in the Bible? Right? And it's not in the Bible, okay? But it's a biblical concept. It's a biblical principle. Okay? There's foundation for it in the Bible, but those words aren't found in the Bible. Okay, last night I talked about your mom tells you if you have nothing nice to say about somebody, don't say anything, right? Well, that's not found in the Bible. It's a biblical principle. And so what happens is commentators, scholars read the text. They read and map the text. Uh, they do what I do, the same thing that I do. I mean, how many of you understand that the words follow me that Yeshua said? He said because... Moses said that one will come after me and you were to follow him. Well, why the words follow me? Because he was clearly identifying himself as the one that Moses said. One will come after me like me, a prophet of God, a messenger of God, one that God knows face to face, and you are to follow him and do everything he tells you or you'll be cut off from your people. Well, don't you think it a little odd that Yeshua would use the word, follow me? And people would just get up and walk? Because what he was saying in those two words was, I'm the one that Moses told you about. I'm the one you've been looking for. Follow me. Clearly the fulfillment of the prophecy from Moses, who said, one will come after me, you are to follow him. 
Well, Elijah didn't come along and say, follow me. As a matter of fact, he said, get away from me. <laughs> Isaiah, Isaiah didn't come along and say, follow me. He said, get away from me. Jeremiah didn't, he was weeping too much. He couldn't even get the words out. <laughs> okay. This one came along and said, follow me. Why? Because unless you studied the Scripture, unless you knew the wording, unless you knew the exact expression he was to use when he came, you wouldn't know that this was the one that Moses was talking about. Why did he have to appear with Moses and Elijah there? Because it was the confirmation. Isn't it the testimony of two or more? It will be established. And didn't Elijah have to come before Messiah? Okay. And Moses was confirming this is the one. These are the words he used, these are the miracles he performed, and now I'm confirming this in your presence so you can see that I, Moses, I, Elijah, who have to come before, this is the one. We're standing here together. What don't you understand about this picture? So the words are very important, but to embellish the words puts it in the area of commentary. Commentary is great for understanding as long as it lines up with the Word of God, but when you add to the Word of God. It's fine to string pearls of Scripture together. That's what I just did. I strung a pearl together. I took what Moses said and what Yeshua said, and I connected them because they're the same words. It's like when I connect the word eights, E-T-Z, eights chaim, tree of life, with the same eights, which is the tree that was used for the sacrifice for Isaac. And it's the same eights, which was used for the stake put in the ground to put the lamb on in Exodus chapter 12, and I use the word eights to talk about the tree that Haman was hung on, and I use the word eights, which is the same word in the Hebrew text about the wood that Messiah was hung on. It's the same word over and over and over again in the Hebrew. It's the same description, same thing over and over again. It's the same pattern and the same picture and the same altar, and the same altar of wood is made out of an eight. And so when you understand that, you see that there's nothing new about all this. It's all very, very old and very foundational. It's one picture repeated over and over and over and over and over again. Now, I'm not adding to the Scriptures. That would be commentary. I'm connecting the Scriptures. That's scholarly. That's biblical. And so we have to understand that the embellishment, if I were to say that it was made out of the same tree, or it was the same piece of wood that was this, or it was the same that, or the crown of thorns that the ram was caught in the thicket was the exact same bush that was used for the crown of thorns for Messiah and was just transplanted. Well, that's extra biblical. That's not found in the Bible. Okay, but the fact that the ram was wearing a crown of thorns and that Yeshua was wearing a crown of thorns, okay, and it was the exact same picture, and I can close my eyes and I can see blood coming down the forehead of the ram caught in the thicket because what ram would be caught with his head in the thicket and not move around? That's illogical. Okay, oh, I'm, I'm caught, I'm fine, I'm a wild animal, it's okay with me. Okay, it's just not the case. Okay, but we see this beautiful picture that God gives us. Okay? Now, does it say that the ram was wearing a crown of thorns? No, that would be extra biblical. That would be a commentary. That would be interpretation. Okay? But the fact that he was caught in a thicket bush, in a thicket bush of thorns, and he had thorns piercing his head, gives me a perfect picture of the Messiah. Okay? So the commentators, the Talmud, goes into great detail about the red heifer. The Talmud goes in and connects historically. And so is the Talmud wrong? The Talmud is not wrong. The Talmud is extra biblical. And so when I teach you, am I wrong when I give you insights and I illuminate for you parts of Scripture? I'm not wrong. But when you walk out of here, walk out of here with a Bible. And walk out of here with a foundation and say, I have better understanding of this particular picture because rabbis shed some light on that, but don't take that teaching of the light and replace the Bible with that teaching. That's the problem in the world today is most people will tell you that they love this commentator because he makes the Bible so easy to understand. Well, he makes the Bible so easy to understand for you in his terms. Now you understand the Bible and now you agree with him. My goal is to get you to agree with God, not with me. I don't care if you agree with me. You're entitled to an opinion. I have an opinion. You have an opinion. We don't have to agree. We don't have to agree on how to interpret Scripture. But we have to understand the application of Scripture. So God's giving us this perfect picture. So Eliezer, the priest, shall take some of its blood. Now he'll take it and sprinkle it seven times toward the front of the tent of meeting, and the cow shall be burned in his sight. Its hide, flesh, and blood shall be burned. Its dung included. And the priest shall take cedar wood, hyssop, and crimson stuff and throw them into the fire, consuming the cow. Wait a second. 
He took the hide, the flesh, the blood, and the dung. He didn't separate the clean from the profane. He took it outside the camp, and he burned it all up together. Why? Why didn't he reserve a portion of it? Why didn't he take it, didn't say to take a portion of it and sacrifice it to the Lord, a portion of it, give it to the priest, a portion of it to do this, and then take the skin and the offal and all this outside the camp and burn that up, but the blood you use to make, pour it out on the altar. Don't you pour the blood on the altar? You don't take the blood and burn it up. Okay, you sprinkle it on the altar, then you pour it out on the altar. Right? You take the choice parts, the choices part, you sacrifice that to the Lord. The rest you cut up, right, the meat portions, okay, you have the elevation portion, you give it to the priest, and so his family is now supported. And the rest of it, it's skin, it's hide, okay? it's, it's uh, remaining bones, the intestines, the, the uh, um, digestive system, the stomach, the entrails, and all these things which are unclean are taken out and burned outside the camp because you can't, have a, you can't burn them, you can't burn something unclean inside the camp. But all this was taken outside. Right? So the red heifer is treated differently because it's a special sacrifice. It's the only sacrifice made which you take the parts of that sacrifice, the ashes, and you use them for cleansing. So what does that mean? Was Messiah consumed in his entirety or were parts of him taken off? Wasn't he taken outside the city? Right? He was taken outside the walls and all of him was sacrificed, wasn't it? All of him except for, oh, I would imagine how many drops of blood, let me just imagine for a minute when Asai was pierced, how many drops of blood might have come from him. Um, seven? I don't know, the Bible doesn't tell me. But when I see perfect pictures, I can just imagine that his blood and water are coming out of the side of the temple, blood and water are coming out of the side of Messiah, and I know now a pattern of taking something outside the camp and sacrificing it outside the camp. And now I see this beautiful picture of what I'm seeing happening, and why is it? Because the ashes of the red heifer were taken for the cleansing. It was because the total sacrifice was consumed, and what was left over was used for cleansing. What was left over of Messiah? What did he leave behind? He sent ahead, ten days later, he sent what? The Holy Spirit. For what? The cleansing. We're, right? Aren't we cleansed with sin? We don't take the actual blood of Messiah on us, do we? I mean, we don't take a bucket and you go by over here and get the blood. No, you plead the blood. You apply the blood. You claim the blood. But you don't have to deal with the blood, do you? No. But what do you have to contend with? The Holy Spirit. All the time. So the priest shall wash his garments and bathe his body in water. After that, the priest may re-enter the camp, but he shall be unclean till evening. Why? Because he's been with a dead body. So he has to go outside the camp, and he's been with a dead body. So he now has to go through a ceremonial cleansing process. He who performed the burning shall also wash his garments in water, bathe his body in water, and be unclean until evening. A man who is clean shall gather up the ashes of the cow and deposit them outside the camp in a clean place to be kept for... The water of lustration for the Israelite community. The water of lustration is a, a living water, a cleansing water. It is um, to be kept in a clean place. It is for cleansing. He who gathers up the ash of the cow shall also wash his clothes and be unclean till evening. This shall be a permanent law for the Israelites and for the strangers who reside among you. He who touches the corpse of any human being shall be unclean for seven days. Let's talk about this. Was Yeshua ever unclean? Ah, some say yes, some say no. Did Yeshua ever touch a dead body? Come on, work with me here. Did he? You mean when he said uh, the words, don't be concerned about your daughter? She's alive? I mean, was she still dead when he got there? No. Yeshua couldn't be the Messiah if he touched something dead. He'd be unclean. Was Messiah ever unclean? Did he touch the leper before his leprosy was healed? 
If he's the power of God to heal, as I'm reaching out my hand, as I'm speaking to you, as I'm speaking the words, by your faith you're healed. You're healed. Don't worry about your daughter, she's not dead. I can go in there and she may not be breathing. And there's no EEG, EKG, there's no medical, modern medical science, but if the Messiah says she's not dead, he can lay on top of her, he can grab her hand, he can do whatever he wants, but he's already proclaimed she's not dead. Read the scriptures. Does it ever say he took the dead, lifeless body, lifted it up to God and said, oh God, if it's your will, bring this back to life? Never said that, did he? Lazarus dead for four days, and all he had to do was speak. He shows you the pattern right there. All I have to do is say, come forth. All I have to do is say to the centurion, don't worry about it. Your servant's healed. Don't worry about your child. They're healed. Wow, I got news. My child was healed. At what hour was my child healed? Oh, at the very same hour, 11 o'clock or 7 o'clock or whatever the time was, when he said they were healed. So you mean when I proclaim walking up to that dead body, reaching out my hand, you're alive, you're not dead, and then I touch you, are you alive or dead? You're alive. Wasn't Messiah a Torah observant, raised with Pharisees? How could he fulfill the law if he broke the law? Had he been unclean, don't you think the Pharisees would have used that against him? Don't you think they would have said to him? He said, if you, he said show me my sin. Didn't he stand before them in the court and say, show me my sin? If you have a sin to accuse me of, accuse me of it. Show me my sin. I am without sin. Well, let me tell you, it would have been sin if he touched a dead body and then didn't go through a ritual cleansing. It would have been a sin. He would have defiled the camp. That's sin. There's 613 Levitical laws, Levitical instructions, 365 no's, and the rest of them are yeses. He would have broken one of the do nots, thou shalt not that. So how could he say I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill, Matthew 5, 17. I came to fulfill the law. What does that mean, fulfill the law? I know what many of you are taught, but that's a bunch of bunk. That's a man's, that's man's uh, semantical terminology. Fulfill, make it more full. Fulfill means meet the requirements of. That means there's 613 specific things that he had to either do or be prepared in this particular way in order for him to be the sacrifice. He had to be without blemish or spot in order to be the Passover lamb. He had to be prepared a certain way. He had to be, live a certain life. In order to be the sacrifice, he had to be placed in a certain place. He had to be handled a certain way. All that in accordance with Leviticus. And so therefore, he was the fulfillment. He met the requirements of. It's almost a numerical impossibility for one person to meet the 613. To fulfill them, all of them, can't be done. Yet he did them all. And so we need to understand that. He who touches the corpse of any human being shall be unclean for seven days. He shall cleanse himself with it on the third day and on the seventh day and then be clean. If he fails to cleanse himself on the third and seventh days, he shall not be clean. Whoever touches a corpse, the body of a person who has died and does not cleanse himself, defiles the Lord's tabernacle. That person shall be cut off from Israel. Since the water of lustration was not dashed on him, he remains unclean. His uncleanness is still upon him. This is the ritual. When a person dies in a tent, whoever enters the tent and whoever is in the tent shall be unclean seven days, and every open vessel with no lid fastened down shall be unclean. And in the open, anyone who touches a person who was killed or who died naturally or human bone or a grave shall be unclean seven days. Some of the ashes from the fire of cleansing shall be taken for the unclean person, and fresh water shall be added to them in a vessel. <coughs> Excuse me. A person who is clean shall take hyssop dip it in water, and sprinkle it on the tent and all the vessels and, and people who were there or, in, or on him who touched the bones or the person who was killed or died naturally or the grave. Now many of us have seen this represent, representation today with the sprinkling of holy water. 
right? There are churches that still participate in the sprinkling of holy water. And so that goes back to this tradition. Even though they're founded on things that are all things not Jewish, they still have many representations of these Jewish traditions, or what would be considered to be Torah-observant Israelite Jewish traditions. The clean person shall sprinkle upon the unclean person on the third day and on the seventh day, thus cleansing him by the seventh day. He shall then wash his clothes and bathe in water, and at nightfall shall be clean. If anyone who has become unclean fails to cleanse himself, that person shall be cut off from the congregation, for he has defiled the Lord's sanctuary. The water of lustration was not dashed on him. He is unclean. As members of the body of Messiah, what are we supposed to do each and every day? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Isn't that what you're supposed to do every day? What are you washing with? What did Yeshua say? Whoever drinks from this living water, not dead water. This is dead water. Something had to be dyed. The ashes had to be mixed into it to make it purifying water. Now Yeshua again is telling you something from Scripture, something from Torah. When he says to you that I am the living water, and on that seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles, on the last and final day, the great day of the Feast of Tabernacles, he stood there. And as the rabbis were making their trips down with their golden pitchers, down to the Pool of Salaam and picking up the water and coming in on the seventh day and pouring it out and praying for rain, and their second prayer when they poured out the water was for the Messiah to come. What do you think that they were looking for? They were looking for the Mashiach. And he said to them, what? I am living water. So the Yeshua, is, Yeshua, the Messiah, is living water. If he's living water, you're being cleansed, aren't you? How many of you have ever been to a Jewish cemetery, either with me or, or uh, to, a, to a funeral? I always require at the funeral a pitcher of water. Why? Because when I leave, the Jewish tradition is when you leave the grave site, you wash the death from your hands. When you enter the home of someone who's in mourning, you will find a pitcher, usually with two handles. So you're not touching what's already been two handles. I take and I use the right handle to pour on the left hand. I take the left handle to pour out on the right hand before you enter the house. So death will not enter that house again. It is a cleansing, still observed today, a cleansing. If I do your funeral, I will require the funeral home to have that prepared. And there are towels there. Okay? And I will usually stand there with the towel as you wash your hands. I will dry your hands. Why? The washing of the feet that Messiah did, the washing of the hands that we do, were washing death from us. And he did that. He took the death off of them and he cleansed them. It's all part of the tradition that's laid out here in Numbers for the washing of death so you are not unclean. Quite a picture, isn't it? Quite a picture of Jewish life, of Jewish thought, of the Hebrew mind that says that it doesn't matter if the tent of meeting isn't there anymore. These are everlasting. Doesn't it say that these are everlasting? Doesn't it say this is for you as an everlasting covenant? These things are to be observed. So then why don't we do them? Well, we still do. This is the ritual. So if anyone has become unclean, fails to cleanse himself, that person should be cut off from the congregation. He's defiled the Lord's sanctuary. The water of lustration was not dashed on him. He is unclean. That shall be for them a law for all time. Yes, Earl. I'd like to go back to chapter 19, verse 6 again, and ask you, uh, if you do, you know the significance of the scarlet yarn. Yes, all those were, those are the three items required for the healing of leprosy. When you made a poultice or you made the application of what to heal a leper, okay, these were the th three things that you used. You used the cedar wood, the hyssop, and crimson yarn. 
okay? And that was symbolic of the cleansing, and this was what he's used for the cleansing to try to clean uh, if somebody was leprous. Uh, it was, um, uh, those are the three, hold on, I can give you from, uh, hold on. Uh, first, the animal was selected had to be without blemish, red in color, and never yoked for service. The red color may point to the blood being shed, but perhaps the color speaks of the red earth out of which the first man was made. Uh, it's not the same slaughtering of the animal. Uh, while the body was burning, dropped three important items into the fire, cedar wood, hyssop, uh, and scarlet wool, all of which were used in the cleansing ceremony for a healed leper. Uh, from Leviticus 14 and 4, 6, 49, 51, 52, and Psalms 51 and 7. Cleanse me with his up. All right, so Leviticus 14 and 4, Leviticus 14 and 6, Leviticus 14 and 49, uh, those were used in the cleansing ceremony for a healed leper. So this all became part of a cleansing, if you would, elixir, a holy water that was purified with the same elements that were used for the healing. Rabbi, when we were when we were at the uh, Wailing Wall in the restroom, uh, the I would consider the Orthodox Jewish people that had the black on and all. They were there were cups attached to the faucets Correct. in the restroom, and it was attached by cable or something. And they were using that in the restroom. And although I felt like I probably needed to do the same, I didn't do that. Well, when you, you want to know <laughs> so the, I didn't know what was going on. Okay, the reason for that is, is all right, so I've washed my hands, okay? Let's say I take my, my uh, hand with soap still on it, all right? It's still dirty, right? I haven't rinsed it yet. And I take and I grab the handle and I pour it out, all right? Now then I take that same handle again. Aren't I recontaminating, right? How many of you use a restroom and you try not to touch things because you know that a dirty hand was already in the place where your clean hand's going, right? You had that. Well, Jewish tradition was is you made a pitcher with two handles. I never reused the dirty handle twice. So I grab a hold of the, with my right hand, I grab a hold of this handle, okay? And now the right hand, okay? And I wash that, I rinse that. Now this one's clean. I grab a hold of the left handle, okay, which has never been touched by unclean. Right? And I pour out the water on my, on my hand, which now I don't put my hand back on the right handle. And so when you think about it, I haven't cross-contaminated. And that's what happens when you use uh, the faucets. You've cross-contaminated. That same dirty hand, I went and turned it on with my dirty hand. Now I wash my hands, I rinse my hands, and I go and touch the contaminated faucet that I just used. I just touched it with my dirty hand. Haven't I just re re And this is the elimination of that contamination. So the left handle would always be the clean handle. Make sense? And so this is very practical, but it's not practical in your cupboards. It's not practical. Laura and I have one at home, uh, <clears throat> that amber one. Is it here? Okay, we have it here. Where do we have it? In your office or somewhere important? <laughs> no, you won't go get it because our time's up. It's 11.55. So we've got to go. So we've got to hurry, and we've got to close. All right, let me read these last lines of this so we can close out in chapter 20. Moses did as the Lord had commanded. The, they ascended uh, Mount Hor in the sight of the whole community. Moses stripped Aaron of his vestments and put them on his son Eleazar, and Aaron died there on the summit. Am I in the right place? No, I'm on the wrong page. This shall be for them a law for all time, for the he who sprinkled the water of lustration shall wash his clothes, and whoever touches the water of lustration shall be unclean until evening. Whatever that unclean person touches shall be unclean, and the person who touches him shall be unclean until evening. And this explains why that handle is never contaminated, because you don't want to cross-contaminate. So if you're clean and you touch somebody unclean, what does that make you? Okay. Uh, sound like unevenly yoked? What does clean have to do with profane? What does holy have to do with unholy? Don't yoke yourself to clean and profane. All right, today is July the 2nd. Let's mark it there. We'll come back together again. Don't forget, no class this Tuesday, but normally there are classes on Tuesdays, two of them, and we'll get back together again the next time I will see you, unless you have an appointment with me next week, is on Shabbat. So I wish you all a Shabbat Shalom, a Shavua Tov. Have a great week, and uh, please, please, please pray for us. And uh, 
Don't forget to pick up a brochure about the Israel trip. We'll have nice ones for you. And then when we come back, hopefully we'll have information for you about a cruise to Alaska for next August, next July, August. So another benefit, fundraising benefit that we're doing that uh, we just keep getting invited to do these benefit trips. We like them because <laughs> they're free.